I'm back. I do apologize about that. We are having a couple of technical difficulties. The internet is probably crashing a little bit with everyone all on. It's 8 p.m., right? We've all finished dinner <laughs> and we're all underway online for, um, you know, social social media and getting, getting together with all of our friends and family. So we are trying to reconnect with Annika Manning. We're sorry we dropped out just then. So um, it shouldn't be long till we reconnect with her. So um, if you are just joining us, welcome. This is our first live Q&A with Winning Appliances. I'm Chloe, I'm the National Culinary Manager for Winnings. And, um, and I can see that you're all here and joining us and asking some fantastic questions already. So that's what we're here for is to get together and um, try to answer those questions that um, you may have about baking, um, baking uh, hot cross buns. So I did give Annika's uh, recipe a go today. So um, let we, here we go, Bake Club. They're joining us. Live. Add beautiful. Connect with her and pick up. So she should join us in just a second. Uh, thanks for your patience. And I, I can see there's some great questions there. Will, you're asking about flour, which is the next question. So you must be a mind reader. Oh, there she is. Hello. Here I am. <laughs> We're learning. We're um. Hello. Thank you for being back again. <laughs> <laughs> back again. We're a little bit off with our um with our framing, but we'll work that out as we go. Yeah, we can still see you, which is great. So, um, yeah. Annika, I just did um, catch everyone up about what we're doing and and about your conversation about the yeast. So we might jump into the next question because I did see we had a question there, which is perfect, okay. and it's talking about flour. So if you yeah, could great. talk to us, what's the best flour to use and why? Is it plain flour, double O? Talk to us. So the best flour to use is known as strong flour. It can also be labelled as bread flour or pizza flour. This is a brand that I use quite a lot. It's available at the supermarket, larger sort of supermarkets, but there's a whole range of different brands you can buy. What the main thing is that you need to look at is the protein level, which you'll find, or the protein content, which you'll find just on the nutritional pa panel of the packet. It needs to be above 12%. So plain flour, as we use for our generally for our baking, usually sits at around 10, 10.7%. Um, but why it's important to use a high protein flour is because that's what's going to give your bread flexibility, strength and structure, which breads are well known for. And that what it, it also stops your bread becoming crumbly like a cake or something like that. So you want that high mm -hmm. protein flour to use. So you don't want to use plain flour. The other thing that a lot of people get a little bit confused about is using double O flour. Now, double O flour actually has more to do, the double O is the indication of how fine the flour is, not the protein content of it. So it, double O flour traditionally has a protein content of usually that's similar to plain flour. And so you're going to get a similar consistent or, you know, a similar texture, final texture as you would if you use plain flour. So go for the strong pizza, high protein flour. Amazing. That's perfect. Thank you for breaking that down. And the good question, um, I know that I've actually seen that people are asking, how do you know when your yeast is active? Yeah, well, that's that's another great question. And what you was, you know, what you were recapping earlier was about um, the being able to activate fresh yeast. So when you activate the baked fresh yeast, you put it with a little bit of warm water, lukewarm water, sugar, and flour, and you'll set it aside for about five ten minutes, depending on how warm your kitchen is. Um, and it will start bubbling and frothing in that time. If it doesn't start bubbling and frothing after about 15 minutes, your yeast is probably not active. Now, normally you only have to activate fresh yeast because it's, a, it's less stable than dried yeast, freeze-dried yeast. Freeze-dried yeast is incredibly stable. It's very reliable. I have never had any dried yeast not work for me, so you don't actually have to activate it it will just you can add it to your flour add your wet ingredients and away you go so it's just fresh yeast that you need to make sure that it's fresh mm -hmm. and that it it will activate i mean the other thing with fresh yeast is if it's got a beautiful 
pleasant yeasty aroma and it's quite a pale creamy color that's also a good mm -hmm. indication that it's fresh because it darkens as it gets older and it gets a bit yippy on the nose when you um <laughs> when it gets older too which means that it's going to be less active okay wonderful perfect i've never heard um the smell of, of of a good yeast being a pleasant smell but it is true right it's where the flavor yeah it's true <laughs> and it's like it's it's kind of like that beautiful yeasty aroma that you get from baked bread um mm. and particularly um breads that are quite high in yeast you get more of a pleasant yeasty aroma from those yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. I am going to just um, answer one of the questions. So Matt has just asked, have you tried, because I know you do have one in your test kitchen, have you tried doing hot cross buns with added steam in a steam oven, a combi added steam oven? Steam. steam is fat. So you mean steam in the oven if you've got an oven yeah. with a steam Yeah, function. like it. Brilliant. Absolutely. Hmm. Really good to use a steam function when you're baking hot cross buns. And the reason for this is that you will get what's known as the greatest oven spring. So what oven spring refers to is that the buns at, will rise or the bread that you're baking will rise as much as they possibly can because the crust doesn't set. So the steamy, what's known as steamy heat within the oven stops the crust from um, setting at high temperatures that you bake at and it allows the dough to rise as much as it possibly can before that crust sets. So you get beautiful, crusty outer eventually, um, but that steam will allow you to get the greatest volume. And if you, know, if you don't have a steam oven or a steam function, what I do sometimes is throw a small bowl of kind of sous vide into the bottom of my oven, either on a tray or just straight onto the base of the oven, and that will create steam in your oven initially and will really help that. And it's a great tip for any sort of, bread baking that you're baking at quite high temperatures. Yeah, that's the, that's the um, cheap version of what all chefs use in their commercial kitchens, right? A combi steamers really? and we have the beauty of having them in our own home now. So with like the beautiful Neff ones that you're using in your kitchen, yeah. it's what gives you that crispy outside and the soft middle, which is that textural yeah. element, the bread that we all love, right? That soft middle yeah. and the and chewy crispy outside. Brilliant. And fantastic for like crusty loaves of sourdough and things mm -hmm. like that and shibata and things like that, yeah. Mm, that was a great question. Where thank you for asking yeah. that. Sorry, Matt. That was Matt that asked that question. It was we will Matt. <laughs> um, we will jump on to the next one, which is kneading. Can you use a dough hook to do this if you don't want to get your hands dirty? Which I know is part of the fun of dough. But do you think yeah. that kneading? Yeah. No, you can. I've actually I cheated tonight. I've actually made one lot of dough that I'm going to show you in a minute by hand, but then I've actually kneaded, and you can see the dough hook that I've done has the actual mixture still a little bit still left on it. Um, oh, so yeah. you can use a dough hook, absolutely. Um, the main thing with using a dough hook is it, it'll be quicker than kneading by hand, depending on how sort of enthusiastic and, and sort of vigorously you knead um, generally. But what you'll find is that it will take about two, three, maybe four minutes less. And what you're looking for is the bowl, the sides of the bowl to sort of clear the, the sides. So you can actually see on the bowl that I've used, you can see it's fairly clean. There's sort of not dough stuck to the outside generally. So it's clean the sides of the bowl. But the other thing that you will get is that you'll get this slapping motion on the side of the bowl too. So the kneading, what it does is it develops the gluten in your bread. And as we were talking earlier today with, with, you know, with the flour and what flour you need to use, gluten is really important in breads and hot cross buns. And so what you're doing is you're distributing that moisture throughout your flour and your other ingredients, which helps develop the gluten. So what you need to do is knead it. And as I said, I've done this um, mixture a little bit earlier you knead it until you sort of press your finger into the dough and it springs back so um i'll see if i can see, you can see what i'm doing here but i'll press i'll put a little bit of flour on my finger but if you press into that see how you may not be able to see it but it springs back slightly and what that is showing you is that that gluten has really developed and it's really elastic 
and mm -hmm. it's ready now for its first crew. But you need to do that kneading before you do the first crew with these um, okay. hot cross buns. So, yeah. That's beautiful. And I do have a question that's just come in. What happens if you only have plain flour? Is there any way to correct it? Or well, do we you work can, with I mean, that? You can or... make hot cross buns with all bread with plain flour. It's not going to be your best bread that you're going to make, but it's certainly mm -hmm. doable. What I do say is make sure you knead well so that the most gluten can be developed. Um, you can actually buy bread improvers and actually separate gluten that you can add to flour to boost up the protein and the gluten level mm -hmm. of your flour. So that's an option. But what you'll end up with is hot press buns or bread that's just a little bit crumbly. It doesn't have that strength in structure when you actually, you know, once it's baked. Um, and you'll find that the dough when you're kneading it is less flexible as well. So they're just sort of some telltale signs. But it's, it's interesting because plain flour, as I said, is about 10% protein, whereas bread flour sits between about 12 and 14%. And you think it's not a lot, you know, 12 or 14%, you know, 10 to sort of 13%. It's not a big difference. It actually makes quite a big difference. And you can tell it by the, the texture of your bread. Um, and it'll also, the other thing that it affects is how much moisture that your bread dough will pull in because protein is really thirsty. So the more protein you have in a bread dough, the more moisture it needs to develop that gluten. And it just means that, um, you know, you may have a wetter dough too when mm. you're using plain flour. But don't be tempted to add more flour. Um, that's always one of my tips is when you are kneading Add as little flour as you possibly can, even if your dough is very wet, because over time and with the kneading and the proving, the dough will become less wet purely because that gluten is being developed. Okay, great. That's a good answer. Thank you for that. Um, we have some other uh, questions coming in. Um, at what temperature um, does the dried yeast become affected? Yeah, so uh, yeast, doesn't matter if it's fresh or dried, but yeast is active between 0.5 degrees and 54 degrees. So it will be activated and it will be alive and it will create, it will ferment and create carbon dioxide. Um, we're anywhere within that temperature range. The thing with yeast is that the lower the temperature, the less active it will be. So you can actually prove your dough in the fridge. It'll still be active, but it will take a lot longer to prove. At the other end of the spectrum, if you go over about 30, 32 degrees in temperature, it will still be active, but it'll be incredibly active and it will um, prove very, very quickly. And what the problem with this is, is that if you act, if, if a yeast is fermented too quickly, or prove too quick, or your bread dough is proved too quickly, you can develop some really unpleasant yeasty flavours and it can become quite sour um, and it's almost got a really strong but unpleasant sort of beer flavour to it because of the yeast in that. So okay. yeast really is happiest between about 25 degrees and 28 degrees when you prove it. Um, or, you know, when you ferment it or prove in your bread dough. Um, but try and keep it under about 30, 32. And when you are proving, usually recipes will say prove until it's doubled in size. So mm -hmm. take the, the visual cue above yeah. the timing because it will really depend on your kitchen. If you've got a warm kitchen, yours is going to take a little less time than say your neighbor next door that's got a cool kitchen. So theirs may take an hour and a quarter, yours might take three quarters of an hour. So use the visual cues when you're actually proving dough. Um, and that will, it's a really good kind of barometer for you. Okay, that's great because that, that is fantastic that someone is asking that question. Um, does the right. kitchen hum humidity affect the dough? It does, and temperature affects it, but also humidity. So if you've got humid heat in your um, kitchen, your dough is going to be less dry than if you've got a dry heat in your kitchen. So it's 
Um, I actually had somebody contact me earlier in the week and she, she's in Queensland. Um, it was a hot day. It was quite a humid day. And she was like, my dough is quite wet. Is that okay? And I said, it's fine. Um, but it's, it's being affected by the weather. The other thing she used is a low-protein flour. So obviously the dough hadn't absorbed as much water as, or much moisture as it would have if it was a high-protein flour. And so she was left with quite a wet dough that didn't rise mm. very well. Mm. That's great. That's really good yeah. explanation. Um, we're getting some wonderful questions coming through, guys. So we are reading the comments. So please keep keep um, adding them down the bottom there because we are discussing them. Um, Annika, when is the best time to add your ingredients, like your sultanas, the chocolate? Does that um, affect the dough when you're actually adding it? Yeah, no, it doesn't. I mean, I, I've made actually a dough earlier today. Actually, talking about proving, you might have seen... Mm. What I have done here is this is a, my kitchen's not that warm at the moment. So what I've done is I've put some quite warm or hot water from the tap in a saucepan. And that, I've chosen a saucepan that fits the bowl that I'm proving it in quite snugly. And then sat that over the top. So as you can see, that's now proved and doubled in size. And the other little tip here is that I've chosen a bowl that is twice the size of the amount of the volume of the dough. So I know if I kind of forget how big my dough was or how large or what volume my dough was when I started with, it's a really good indication of once it gets to the top of the dough itself. That's a great so, tip. Um, and, and this dough, as I've kind of kneaded beforehand, that will then go in that dough. And you can just see how it kind of fills the dough and taking into account um, the sort of surface, you know, the, it's, it's wider at the top, obviously, than the bottom. So it's not going to sort of come exactly, but it'll become a little bit over the halfway mark and then mm. cover that up and that can prove. So once you get to this stage, and this one I actually may not, may have seen, but because it's the chocolate one, you may not have seen the chocolate and the sultanas through it, but I've added it as I was mixing it in the stand mixer. I kneaded the dough until it was ready to proof, but then just added the sultanas, or sorry, the raisins and the chocolate just in the last sort of 10 seconds of kneading and then it brought together. But you mm. can add them after you've proofed. And this is what I do in my chocolate recipe. Um, and so once you get to this stage, which actually one thing that I do want to show you is that when a dough proves what it looks like inside and I'm hoping you'll be able to see this um I'll see hopefully we'll be able to do this but can you see oh it's a bit it's a bit hard to see but can you see all that network of mm. gluten that is let's see that can you see that like and a web that right all of the, yeah it's web like and it's the network mm. of the dough um, being and then all the carbon dioxide being captured in there. So all of that gluten and that gluten network is capturing all of that beautiful carbon dioxide that's been created by the yeast. So once you get to this stage and you can sort of either punch it down or I've pulled that apart so it's kind of deflated quite a lot, you can then add your... I'm, this is just a plain one. This is a plain version of the chocolate and all I've done is replace the cocoa powder with the same amount of flour, so 30 grams of flour. And then instead of the chocolate, I've added currants. So if you're not big on chocolate, I don't understand, but, but you can make it into a more traditional hot cross bun recipe, this particular one. So you've sort of got a bit of two for one. Yeah. Um, but what you do is you just turn that out onto a bench with all your little bits and pieces that you're adding and you just knead it in. You, it may need a bit of coaxing to um, pull it Picture. in, <laughs> but it won't take long until it is all combined. I mean, breads that have quite a lot of extra fruit or nuts or whatever, sometimes they do take a little bit of um, kneading and um, encouragement mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. accept those extra bits and pieces, but you can see now that basically 
this dough. I'm just giving it a bit of a good kind of knead. But that has now just taken up all those extra bits and pieces. And so that's, it doesn't really matter if you add it before you prove it or after you prove it that first time. But don't forget to add them because I've done that. <laughs> I've made my dough, thought I would add them, shaped them all, and then went, gosh, they look odd, and then realised I actually hadn't added the fruit. <laughs> it was just the plain bread. Yeah. <laughs> Have to stick some chocolate spread or something on top of that. I'm sure you made yeah. it work. Yeah, sort of poke it, just poke it in. <laughs> exactly. Um, can you double the recipe, Annika? You can double the recipe. Sorry? I said, when one's not enough, can you double the recipe? Yeah, when That's one's not enough. enough. Yeah. So you can double a recipe, but what you'll find is that, particularly if you're making it in your um, mixer with a dough hook, there'll be too much dough there for you to knead. So you want to make it in quantities that relatively easy to knead because it's big batches are hard. What you could do um, is measure out all your ingredients, make two separate batches and then bake them at the same time if you've got an oven that is large enough to do that. Um, but this particular recipe, you could double it to knead it by hand, but I wouldn't recommend to put it in a mixer and knead it. It's just going to be too, too hard on your motor. And that's the other thing actually while you're kneading with a mixer um, with a stand mixer with a dough hook, always use it on the lowest possible setting. Don't think, oh, this will happen more quickly if I turn it up high because it actually um, puts a lot of pressure on your um, motor and it can burn it out. So it can ha it's made for using to, to knead doughs. But mm -hmm. what you'll find is that if you put it right up high, not only will your mixer may start jumping around on the bench top, but you're going to overload your motor and you could burn it out. So just go, go slowly and it's still going to be faster than kneading by hand anyway. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and how do we make the balls all the same size? How do we shape them? What's the tricks to getting them all looking uniform and like your beautiful picture? Yeah, so I'm going to have to move my camera so you can see this. Okay. Um, so let me just bear with me one second. I'm just going to move my um, phone down, but I have to go right round the outside. Okay. All right. I, I saw I'll Annika. Okay, please okay. come back. I just want to make sure that I can see. You can oh, see. Beautiful. Hopefully it won't. Yeah, I can see the bench there. That's great. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, good. We can see. I'm kind of slightly cut off, but that's okay. I can. <laughs> so what you want to do, the best trick is, is to actually weigh your dough. So get your scales out. And this is 884. So say if we were making um, eight dough balls, which we are for this particular recipe. So you need 110 grams per ball. I'm just going to oh, just going to grab a knife out because dough is a lot better to cut through it rather than sort of tear it apart so you don't disrupt those beautiful gluten strands that you have um, created. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to divide this into eight portions roughly and see where we're at with the weight. So remember, we're looking for 110 grams. 111. Oh, Yahtzee. <laughs> Not bad. That's I know, but it's kind of that joy of getting things. <laughs> and that's 112. Wind. So it's, don't be too pedantic. Like, you know, it's, it's when, it, say, 10 grams out, that's going to make a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. But one or two grams is not going to make a huge difference. Now, to get them nice and... Um, uh, even what you want to do is clear your bench of any flour because what you want is a surface that you'll get get a little bit of traction with the dough when you put it on it so we want the dough to stick a little bit to the surface to your bench top or to your breadboard like I've got here so don't have flour because it'll just slip around what you want to do is you want to slam it down cup your hand like it's kind of um, I suppose a little bit of a spider around it 
You need the palm of your hand touching the top of the dough and then your fingers touching the outside of it. And what you're going to do is just go round and round and round with your dough mm. until you feel like it's sort of coming together and that you've got quite a good shape. And what you'll end up with is a beautiful round dough ball. Beautiful. So that's the easiest way of shaping some hot cross buns. I mean, the other way you can do it is turn it um, down and then gradually pull in the sides. Can you see what I'm doing now? I'm sort of turning it and then pulling in the edges. Mm. So you're kind of kneading it in a little bit into the centre. Mm -hmm. Turn it over and then use your hands to... So if it's got, I've got an escapee <laughs> sultana there. Um, and then you can sort of use your hands to shape it. But I quite like doing the slam down and, um, you Is know, there I don't really even have a technical it? name for it. <laughs> Sorry, it's like a stress that? ball, right? A stress ball. Sorry, is that what that? it is? I said, is it like a stress ball? You're just all that frustration yeah, of being inside it. all the time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, um, it's a really quick, easy way of getting, you know, those <laughs> round rolls very effective. It sometimes takes a little bit of practice. So if you do it for the first mm. time, you're like, oh, this doesn't feel right. Just make sure that the palm of your hand is quite firm on the top and your fingers are quite firmly around the outside of it. So it's only got a little bit of space sort of to juggle in between that. And you'll end up with a really nice round hot cross bun. That would be so much fun to get the kids involved in too, right? Who doesn't yeah. want to throw yeah. around some dough and yeah. get your yeah. kids And get them kneading yeah. too. Kneading is great because I know in our kids' classes, we give them all a, a piece of dough like this and it's quite mm. sticky to start with, um, which they love. Um, but kneading for kids, if you've got a dough like this, it's just tossing it between hands. It's pulling it. It's slamming it mm. down. Kneading is about um, manipulation of the dough. So it doesn't actually matter how you do it, as long as that dough is moving and it's stretching and it's being pushed and pulled, and that will still develop your gluten. That's great. That's wonderful. I know it's my part, my therapy. Kneading dough is my kind of therapy. There's something yes. about it, isn't it? I know. I, um, I opt to sort of opt for hand kneading over machine kneading quite often, just purely for that fact that you can get lost mm. in it for ten minutes, and it's a bit of kind of mindfulness and um, mm. you know a moment for you to kind of stop. I, I find also if I'm a little bit, you know, I've got some pent up kind of frustration I want to get out. It's a really mm. good exercise for that as well. Mm. Wonderful. Um, someone did ask if they do have a chilly kitchen, maybe they're working somewhere which is a colder climate, um, what is some tips on how to prove their dough correctly? Yeah, so that's a great question. You can use the little tip that I um, had before with you using a saucepan filled about half mm. full with hot water from the tap. But, and then placing your bowl over it so the bowl doesn't touch the water. You don't want the bowl touching the water. Cover it over with plastic wrap and put that aside somewhere. What you'll find is you may have to replenish that water um, during the proving process, but generally, and, and usually about three or four times. So just keep an eye on it, come back to it, see if it needs replenishing and then you'll be fine. The other way that I love using is either a styrofoam box or your microwave. And so you're not going to turn your microwave on, but what you're going to do is use it as a compartment that is sealed off. And what you do is you put your, your dough in your bowl, as I have here with the chocolate one. You're going to cover it over with plastic wrap, and then you're going to put it into your microwave or your styrofoam box. Put a jug of hot water um, in with the bowl, just sitting beside it. doesn't need to touch it and then close the door or put the lid on. And what that does is it creates an environment that mm. is beautifully moist, but also that it, the hot water heats the, the small space around the dough and allows it to rise to a temperature that's very similar to sort of 28, 30 degrees. Mm. Um, so that's a great one. Finding some dappled sunshine 
um, in sort of autumn or spring is always a good thing to do. Make sure it's, you know, if you take it out into the garden, make sure that it's out of a drafty spot. Um, mm. The other thing to do is put your pilot light on in your oven. If your oven has a pilot light, shut the door and that will kind of create an environment to where you can prove it quite happily. So if, you're, if your kitchen is not so warm and it needs <laughs> a little bit of help, um, then you can do that. I mean, I've got a student who's just done an online course with me who's based in Darwin and her problem was the opposite. She was like, yeah. oh, it's just so hot. So she was actually proofing her dough in the fridge and she found that that worked really well. Or she did the opposite where she put the bowl over a saucepan of cold water, like iced water. water. And then that kind of brought that temperature down. So that was a really good thing too that um, she was able to do. Um, and you also do, some people may have combi steamers or just regular ovens at home. Always check the functions in your oven because there are actual settings on the oven that are perfect for dough proofing. They're set at the right temperature for you. So make sure you check out your appliances at home because a lot of them now these days do have that setting because everyone's interested in doing bread and things from home. So make sure you check out your appliances at home. You did say something interesting there as well, Annika, and it was about putting dough in the fridge. So yes. is there a possibility that, uh, say, uh, you've got kids at home and they're screaming, they want your attention, you don't have that time to continue what you're doing, is there a process where we can stop it uh, and come back to it a little bit later? Yeah, so the main, the main two spots where you can stop and halt it is mm. that, or three spots actually, so is that you've combined the dough but you haven't kneaded it yet. You can pop that mm. in the fridge um, you know, and, and you would only put it in the fridge if you're going to be away for more than probably an hour. Um, the other place you can halt it is once you've kneaded it and before that first proof or what's known also as a bulk proof. And the other time that you can halt it is once you've shaped your bread or your rolls and you put pop that in the fridge too. So in the fridge, because we're, it's about four degrees, it usually takes overnight to prove to the same rate mm -hmm. as it would for an hour at about 28, 30 degrees. So mm -hmm. tonight, I'm not going to bake the, the, the dough tonight. The kids are dying to get some hot cross <laughs> buns. And I said, yes, yes, I'm going to bake them, but I'm not baking them tonight. So I'm actually going to shape the, finish shaping the ones I've got. I'll put those in the fridge and they'll prove overnight. The, the chocolate one, I will prove in the bowl overnight, and then I'll take it out and shape it. The thing with proving in your fridge, what you need to do is make sure that the dough or the buns sit at room temperature for long enough that that yeast is kind of really reinvigorated again. So you need to bring the dough almost back to room temperature again before you bake it. Because what can happen is you can put cold dough into the oven and your yeast won't be activated and therefore you won't get that oven spring that I was talking about earlier today. So it's really important that you don't bake it straight from the fridge. Smaller buns like these, you know, if you're, they're spaced out and there's lots of kind of, um, uh, they've got lots of surface area, they're going to come back to room temperature a lot more quickly than, say, a whole loaf or these buns that are baked in a cake tin altogether. So um, just keep that in mind. But that it's a great way to prove dough, and particularly if you want fresh bread first thing in the morning. Who doesn't love that smell of fresh bread in the yeah. morning? <laughs> it's trying not to eat the whole loaf by the end of the day. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> That's a challenge, isn't it? It's such a challenge. Yeah. And I think the challenge for all of us now is, although my neighbours will get all hot cross buns tomorrow as well, but, you know, mm. for people living, they might be just themselves and their partner. It's kind of like, oh, what do I do with them all? I mean, you can freeze them. Um, that is an option. But I think a lot of people will go, well, you know what, we'll just graze our way through them. <laughs> Exactly. So in, is that the best way to store them, to freeze them, or how do we reheat them? What's the best way if, say, you were to bake them tonight and we want to eat them with the family tomorrow or 
we're all to ourselves, um, what's the best way to reheat them and store them? Yeah, it's a great question. And so reheating, the best way to do that is to wrap them in foil, either individually or as a whole bun. Um, and what I do before I actually close the foil off, I sprinkle them with a little bit of water, which will allow some steam to be created and it will keep them really moist and it will really refresh them. So it's like... Um, refreshing any sort of bread loaf. You've got a little bit mm -hmm. of a stale bread loaf that will do it beautifully. I usually put it in at about 180 centigrade, um, conventional or 160 fan forced um, or fan assisted. And I, depending, you know, small buns like this would generally take about 10 minutes. If it's a whole loaf, it can take up to about 20 minutes. But you can just open the foil, test it. You'll usually be able to tell by just um, touching it how warm it is. Um, mm. and that, that's a good way. And then, I mean, if you want to freeze them and you want to toast them straight from frozen, you can do that. So that's a really lovely way of reheating your bread um, rolls because you've got a little bit of moisture that's left over from that freezing process that keeps them nice and moist anyway. And with the toasting, mm. you get beautiful, crisp kind of outside crust as well. So... Yeah. I think that's what we find in the Winnings Kitchen, the chefs that we have working at Winnings. One of the best way to show a combi steamer on how great it is, is the reheat function. So when you have bread yes. that maybe is a couple of days old, you pop it back into a combi steamer and adding the moisture back into the bread is what you, has lo you have lost. It's not moldy, it's just almost dehydrated, right? It's putting the moisture yeah. back into the product that returns it back to how it was when you baked it. So I love Absolutely. that little tip and about think... putting the water yeah, and I think too, because bread, it does go stale quite quickly and it's mainly because it's usually low in sugar, low in fat. And sugar mm. and fat are the two things that will really preserve bake. So that's why butter cakes last for quite a few days. Mm. Um, whereas bread and things like scones that are low in fat and sugar usually don't. So um, using that little tip to repeat. And, and it's more effective than not wrapping it too. So you can use the, the steam function or if you don't have that, wrap it in foil so it creates its own little atmosphere. Beautiful. That's great. And we'll take this last little question here before we do wrap oh, up, which is um, do you need to prove them again after the shaping process? Yes. You do. So that is all in the recipe. Um, but usually um, they will take sort of 30 minutes to half an hour to prove a, a sort of a hot cross bun this size. But because also that they're all in a tin together, it usually takes a little bit longer. So it's all to do with the two things that will affect how long you need to prove something for. The recipe will always recommend it you know, a length of time. But again, the temperature in your kitchen, the higher it is, the shorter period of time it'll take, the lower the temperature, the longer it will take. But the other thing that will affect it is the surface area, which is exposed to that um, sort of air. And so if you're baking individual buns like this as individual buns, they'll take less time than if you're baking them all together or a whole loaf. So that kind of, you know, makes a difference as well. That's perfect. Thank you so much for your time this evening, Annika. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So the recipe is on the winning website. So it's under the inspiration recipe section. Make sure you check out all of the Easter recipes that Anna, Annika has written for us. There's some beautiful ones in there. And we will be back again on Saturday, Annika. We get to get together again to talk about macarons. And I believe you're going to tell us how to make the perfect ones. Is that right? Yes. Yes, perfect. We're doing raspberry and chocolate macarons, mm -hmm. which will make a really beautiful Easter Sunday gift if anyone wants to make them for someone special. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. We'll make sure you check out all of her recipes. And thank you for joining us tonight. I know we have run a little bit over, but um, we're glad that you all could make it. And we hope to see you again here on Sunday. Um, sorry, Saturday at 2 Saturday. p.m. And, yep, Saturday. I, I know. I'm losing track of days. I'm sure everyone is. At, <laughs> I don't think you're it's the only one. Yeah, you're not the only one, Chloe. <laughs> exactly. Well, happy Easter to everyone. I hope you all enjoy your Good Friday, however you spend it. Remember to stay safe, stay indoors, unless you need to go out and take care of each other and have a wonderful uh, rest of your um, Easter Eve, I should say. Thanks, Take Chloe. care, everyone. Thanks, Annika. Bye. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Pleasure. Bye. Let's do it again. <laughs>
Yeah, we will. Saturday. See you then. Thanks, everyone.